Hey everyone, Mike and Greg here from Video Maker. Uh, we're doing another Q and A this week. This time, a special treat. Um, we have uh, a guest here. You may know him from uh, his uh, very famous YouTube videos, the uh, Assassin's Creed Parkour and the World's Largest Rope Swing. Uh, Devin Graham, aka Devin Supertramp. Devin, how you doing? I am doing good. Good to be here, guys. It's like old times. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's right. So watching your your videos, I would say that you definitely have a a consistent shooting style. And I mean, like it's almost like you could see one of your videos and know that you shot it before you even knew that it was you who shot it. How did you sort of develop that style, and and what helps you create that style? Yeah, so the style it definitely has evolved, um, and it's definitely changed over time. Like I was actually going through all my videos last night, and I noticed that I've, I've slowly evolved. And going into YouTube, I didn't honestly know what my style was with how I was going to do it. So if you watch my first like four videos, five videos, every video is completely different. One's super cinematic, one's very like action support oriented. So it's like as I've dabbled in a lot of different things, I've kind of developed my own style and it's been based on things that I'm passionate about. It's like, how would I like to see that shot? And then that's kind of how I approach it now. Um, so that's, I think, how the style has evolved is from doing things that I love. Cool. Very good. Actually, uh, I was going to ask you about uh, your shooting style as well, specifically with regards to stabilization. And I'll just quickly mention, uh, we should thank Glidecam for sort of setting yeah. up this interview. Uh, so Glidecam hooked us up with Devin, so as a sort of trade-off, we decided, hey, we're, we'll put this uh, HD2000 here on the table as sort of a product placement thing. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, you do all of your shooting, or at least a, a good chunk of it, on the Glidecam uh, HD4000, right, the, the heavy-duty yep. one. Um, what makes you decide to go with that model versus one with like a sled and vest system? Yeah, so I mean, I started filming with Glidecam 10 years ago, and I started doing wedding videos, and I was watching wedding videos, and I'm like, I didn't feel there was anything cinematic about it, and I love the cinematic look. So I started researching what Hollywood was using, and they were using what was called a steady cam, which is a very, very expensive camera setup. Um, so I was looking at something that was a lot within a price range that I could actually afford, and that's when I found the Glidecam. So I started filming with the Glidecam 2000 because the camera I was using was much smaller. Um, and now I'm using the Glidecam 4000 because it fits a lot more for my knees. But what it allowed me to do was shoot these wedding videos so they looked super cinematic like it was something straight out of a movie. So it started getting my videos attention because they look different than all the other wedding videos. So when I started my YouTube channel, it was the same idea as I wanted my YouTube videos not to look like someone just shot it on their phone and was running all over the place. I wanted it to look like a Hollywood movie, so that's why I went with Glidecam. And I've been using it ever since. I now film with the Red Dragon, so a lot heavier camera. Um, with uh, the glide cam. Now, the reason I don't use the vest, going back to the original question, is for me personally, like I'm traveling and hiking in a lot of places, sometimes 15, 20 miles. So the less equipment I can bring, the better off I am. So I'm trying to avoid bringing in everything else. And a lot of times I'm running through small, like, um, hallways and stuff like that. So I can't have an arm sticking out and, and avoiding everything. And I film so much with it now that I can kind of counterbalance everything without the vest and the arm and all the other contraptions that are out there. Yeah, the, the shots that you have, at least in your final videos, I mean, they're, they're pretty much rock solid throughout. Do you use much post-stabilization on that or is it pretty much organically that smooth? I would say 90% of the time it's all organically smooth. We try and do everything in camera. Um, if we're going to use any post-stabilization, because we edit everything in Adobe Premiere, um, Creative Cloud, they have something called Warp Stabilizer, so we'll throw that on. And what happens, though, is it, it can work really well, but sometimes it doesn't work as well, so we'll give it kind of a warp jello effect. So we try and avoid it at all costs and shoot it mostly in camera. Um, our Assassin's Creed videos, which a lot of people are familiar with, like those videos specifically, they actually don't have any image warp stabilizer at all going on. That's straight out of cameras if we're running down down the street. So that just comes with practice, though. I know a lot of people are saying, hey, I just picked up a glide <laughs> cam and it doesn't look the same as yours. It just it takes practice. It's like riding a bike. But once you know how to ride a bike, you know how to ride a bike. So it comes with time, but it is something that can be developed and learned. Awesome. Yeah, this, uh, these things do take quite a bit of finesse. Uh, you know, the gimbals are pretty sensitive. In fact, I think uh, Glidecam asked if we could do like an on-screen demo, and I don't think that would be necessarily a great idea. Cause we're not as <laughs> Better to watch your right videos now. as an example <laughs> than to watch my test footage. That's right. So yeah. um, sort of speaking of the skill involved and all that, um, what are your thoughts on all of the uh, motorized sort of 3-axis gimbals like Moby's hitting the, in the market? Uh, you know, we've picked up uh, a few of those. 
uh, the Movi uh, M5 and the DJI Ronin. They're like super, super easy to just pick up and go and everything's super smooth, but you have sort of stuck with the analog solution. So what's your thoughts on those systems? Yeah, so I, I feel very strongly that there's a tool for every story and a tool to tell the story the way you want to tell it. So I feel there's a purpose for those. We actually have bought one. Um, we used it for a little bit, and then it was this, for me personally. It was it was too complicated for what I want to do. Like generally, it takes fifteen to thirty minutes to actually balance one of those systems. The Glide Cam it takes me thirty seconds to balance the Glide Cam. The other one you need batteries as well. And then the thing is, is like how am I going to charge these batteries? I'm out here camping for a week. I don't. I, I can't bring a hundred batteries on my back. Um, so there's there's pros and cons. I feel to both of them. For me though, I, I feel a lot more pros. Are for the glide cam. The glide cam to me, it's a lot more organic looking. As far as there's nothing kind of mechanical about it, because it is like you said, it is an analog system. So you're doing everything with the touch instead of running on motors and everything else. So for me, it's a lot better set up for like the stories that I want to tell. So do you, when you're filming these videos, I mean, obviously different videos might be different, but how much do you think about like sort of the classic rules of shooting? Because you know, video maker, we teach a lot of the the basics to people, like the 180 degree rule, for example. Um, and things like that. Do you think about that stuff a lot while you're shooting? Is it sort of ingrained at this point? Yeah, it's ingrained. Like I, I did go to film school and we learned the 180, the rule of thirds and stuff like that. And I think and they, they teach the same thing in film school is once you know the rules, then it's okay to start breaking them in and going in, in different things. But I'm always subconsciously aware of those rules, but I'm never like, I don't go on a set saying, okay, am I following the 180 rule? I, I just think this isn't going to cut together and it's going to confuse people. Got so it. I think that once you know the rules and they're ingrained in you and you shoot, I mean, if you're shooting every day, they're going to get ingrained super fast and then you're kind of taken care of where you don't have to subconsciously think about every decision that you're making. So um, when you're out shooting, um, you know, in these remote locations, like uh, your most recent one in Guatemala, um, what is your shooting ratio like when you're out there sort of sort of shooting as a documentarian, a documentarian or even uh, shooting probably something that's a little more uh, staged like uh, like the uh, Far Cry 4 video, what's the shooting ratio look like? Yeah, so when we were shooting on the 5D, I, I looked at my first project last night, and that first project was 30 gigs. I mean, that was in 1080p, and now our projects, they're about 2 terabytes. Now, that's shooting with 6K and everything else, but essentially, we're filming, I would say, 8 to 1 or 10 to 1, um, which I think is kind of standard, where we're shooting 10 minutes, and we're going to use about a minute of that footage that we actually shoot. When we're shooting videos like the parkour video, the athletes can only do it three times because then it, it, there's a lot of danger and other factors. So that ratio is three to one. So it, it does depend on what we're filming. The nature stuff, we have a lot more takes. So realistically, that's about 10 to one with what we're shooting. So a uh, uh, follow-up question. On, when you're shooting uh, something like Assassin's Creed or the Far Cry uh, videos, um, can you tell us just sort of about your approach to directing? Are, are you a perfectionist with these takes, or, or do, you, uh, do you tend to be more sympathetic with your actors? Yeah, it depends. And, and we are very, how do I say this? We're a lot more documentary style filmmaking compared to narrative, so we try and capture things as we see them. Um, those ones you give example, though, the more storytelling ones, those are very specific and kind of niche. So like the Far Cry one, we're, we're doing these in one continuous shot, so we don't have, we can't fix it in the editing room. We have to do it on location. So there, we're making sure we get it right, and we're very particular on how we do it. Okay, you have to jump from this car to this car. This is how it looks. So we'll take the footage, we'll look at it on set because we're only filming one day. So we're like, okay, we got to change this and tweak this with Assassin's Creed because it is physically demanding. I have to be happy with the third take, and then we got to move on. And those videos, they take about seven days to shoot the Assassin's Creed ones because it is so physically demanding on their bodies. The one we did in Paris, it took, I think, six days of shooting with four people, um, and everyone was physically exhausted by the time it was over with. Oh, I'll bet. So can you take us through sort of how, I mean, obviously you didn't start off by making videos that were integrated with, you know, the video game brands themselves. You probably did them on your own. How, how can you, how do you, how does your workflow work to get to that point, and, and what is it like to make videos for them now? So I first, like, even when I started with YouTube, I was thinking to myself, 
what are the kind of videos that I want to make? And that's one of the things they talk about in film school is whatever content you're creating is what you're going to essentially get stuck doing. So if you want to do car commercials, start doing them now, but then that's how everyone's going to view you. So I went into it saying, what is the kind of stuff that I want to film? So it's like, I love action support stuff. I love scenery stuff. So I went into it personally doing that, but I also know that that if I'm going to sustain myself, it has to be a business. So there has to be financial income. So that's when the brands came involved. People like Ubisoft, you make Assassin's Creed, and people like Adidas and all these other brands we've worked with is, for me, it's all about proving ourselves before we say, hey, hire us, hire us. So for Assassin's Creed, we went in saying, we want to make the best video possible based on their franchise. We'll show it to them, or hopefully they'll see it, and then they'll want to work with us on another one. That's what happened with Assassin's Creed, is we did that video, and I mean, that video has 40 million views, so it's an easy sell when the brand sees our video, like, oh, he knows the brand, he knows how to reach a massive audience, we want to work with him, and since then, I think we've done three other Assassin's Creed videos, and we've done one on Watch Dogs, Far Cry 2 on Far Cry, so it's it's made a lot bigger opportunities just from volunteering on that first video to kind of prove ourselves. So your videos, uh, it seems like mostly have some sort of brand integration, but you're not really an ad agency, so to speak. So how much you know, creative control do you get to maintain on these projects versus having your clients sort of um, own the production like they would a, you know, a TV commercial or something? Yeah, so if we were a TV commercial company or an actual ad agency, I mean, we'd have so many people report to because it is our YouTube channel, it's our network, it's our audience. So we get to set a lot of the rules because, and then the brands understand that, like that's why they want to work with us, is because like Devin knows his brand better than anyone else, better than we know it, because it's his audience. So they trust us with a lot of that stuff, and but we are, like you said, we are representing their brand, so we want to stay true to that because we want to work with them again. So for example, Assassin's Creed, the last one we did, we knew ahead of time before they even announced the game that it took place in Paris because we're having these conversations five, six months in advance. They're like, it has four player co-op. Um, so we want to feature that, and those are kind of our two big requirements. And then they sent us like character pictures of what the actual characters look like. So we had that way in advance, and so we started actually making that. And then we bounced ideas back and forth. But it is a collaboration, um, and we want to make it a win-win for everyone because we want to work with them again. So it works out really well, though, as far as that goes. Cool. So how long between when you sort of first started making these videos and take us to the point, like how long did it take you to where, I mean, I'm assuming this is your sole way that you're, providing now at this point, right? <laughs> yep. How long did that take to build that audience and, and really make a career out of just those videos? Yeah, so it wasn't a matter of getting lucky as sometimes I, I hear people say, like, I really think like I'm 30 and it's like I've spent 30 years working to this point. So it wasn't going to film school. It was before that I was constantly filming every day. I was making movies with Legos and stuff like that. So over time I've evolved as a filmmaker. I would say the first year I started, I was doing it because I cared about what I was shooting. And I was just doing it for fun. I had some free time. So the first year, though, I started getting um, bigger companies coming to me and saying, we love what you're doing on your YouTube channel. We want to work with you. So I'd say within the end of year one, it was – it started to become a potential of this could actually be a business of something that I love to do and I'm in control of. And then I would say like, because I've had the channel since 2010, October, um, I'd say like year and a half, it was something where that was solely kind of how I was providing for myself. Um, and we have three sources of income and this is what people don't don't realize. We're not hoping that we'll make money just off of YouTube after, after the, the ads that they put on there. But we're also working with brands like Ubisoft. And then the third way is we're selling stock video footage. So companies on television, they'll see what we're doing and they'll buy that. So that's how we're actually able to sustain ourselves as a business run off of YouTube. Oh, cool. So um, speaking of the, the brand integration and getting started, um, you know, you were uh, in a situation where you started working on YouTube uh, kind of in the early days of YouTube. I think YouTube's been around since 2006 or so, but, but 2010 is a long time ago in, when we're talking about uh, Internet years. Um, so uh, nowadays, uh, you know, the sort of regulations behind this are getting more and more strict. And uh, just recently, um, you know, the U.K. Uh, Advertising Standard Agency said that you have to disclose that um, your video uh, includes brand integration or is a sponsored video in the title or in the thumbnail. If you had those uh, kinds of restrictions or regulations on your videos sort of on day one, do you think it would have um, uh, affected how you were able to grow your audience? Would you have had to do things differently or, or what, what are your general thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I do feel as time goes on, the harder and harder it is to get noticed on YouTube. Um, I kind of explain it as the gold rush as far as once everyone knew that there was gold in California, everyone rushed there and the first people there were the people that benefited. But then there was a couple other people that kind of staggered along and then they were able to actually be successful about it. We, we came in at the right time though, so we were able to kind of rise that way. Um, as far as what you talked about with actual brand stuff, I mean, we've been incorporating brands from the beginning. The way I, lo I learned about YouTube is I was working for a company called Aura Brush, who was using advertising to launch their company. And it was the same thing though, as they let people know up front. And the thing is, is content is king is what they say. So as long as the content overall is something that people love, the video will do well whether it's attached to a brand or not. I mean, you've seen so many successful ad campaigns. I think New Spice or Old Spice, Old Spice. Old Spice is a prime example of that or GoPro where they say GoPro right at the beginning. But because the content is so awesome, people will watch it regardless of a brand is attached to it. And I think that's what's happening right now is our audience is, is realizing Devin got to work with Ubisoft. And then they're happy about that because they realize that the content even exists because Ubisoft is even there. So I think it, it is something that's happening and people are appreciating. Whether it would have stopped us, I don't think it would have stopped us just for the fact that I think brands actually empower people. The more and more time goes on, the more people see that. Yeah. So I noticed the most recent videos that you have now are 4K. How was what made you sort of take the leap and what was that process like sort of because that's a big big shift Yeah, so that's a it was a very scary risk on our end because it's like we're shooting everything 1080p We hardly are filming any hard drives I mean we're going from these little teeny hard drives to big hard drives and let me just kind of show you an example once we switched over to our red hard drives we ended up having to get all of these hard drives, and this is just in my kitchen. And these are 32 terabytes each. So we go from 2 terabyte projects to 32 terabyte projects. Oh, my gosh. And those are a lot more expensive as well. Um, but what we kind of was the final thing for us, the final step, is we want all our footage future-proof. We want it to last. We don't want our, our HD footage to not be HD footage a couple of years from now. And we know 4K, 6K is the future because that's where everything is headed. But what we also found out is because going back, like one of the third ways we make money is selling our video footage for TV companies and people like Samsung would come to us and they're like, we want 4K content. Do you have any 4K content? And at the time we were like, we actually don't have any 4K content. So it was like, if we want to meet the demands of what people want, we actually have to have it. So then we're like, we got to switch over. We got to do it fast. So it did change our whole infrastructure as far as how many hard drives we have to now buy six times more hard drives because we film everything in 6K. Um, so it's cost us a lot more, but we're actually able to make the same amount of money because we're selling that 4K footage for, for bigger companies. Cool. So, uh, you know, you used to shoot uh, primarily on the, uh, the, the Canon, the 5D. I mean, if you're uh, behind the scenes videos or any indication, it seemed like just recently you switched over to um, the Epic Dragon. Um, so is that pretty much what started that shift and, and what, what pushed you towards red versus, you know, going for something like a, a C500? Yeah, so, we, yeah, like you said, we were shooting on the Canon 5D, then we evolved to the Canon 5D Mark III, and then we still use the 5D for all our behind-the-scenes videos, so it hasn't been something we've thrown away way or gotten rid of. And we still shoot everything on Canon lenses, so nothing has become obsolete as far as that goes. Um, I got the Canon 1DC, which is a Canon DSLR that shoots 4K. It's a lot, it's the most expensive cam, Canon camera out there as far as DSLR goes. Um, we've always tried to keep everything really small. And the reason why we had to go to RED, the reason why we decided to go with RED specifically is because they're one of the few people that can actually shoot RAW in 4K or 6K, and that's kind of the industry Hollywood standards as far as most big Hollywood movies that are going to go in that direction. They're using the red camera. I mean, The Hobbit's a good example of that Spider-Man. Um, because they're using it, we want to be where the industry is so we can understand that. Um, so that's why we switched over to red. and it does have a really great workflow, and I like the ideas behind it all. Cool. Uh, so obviously now that you're shooting with the red, you're using, you're getting a pretty flat picture out of that. Before that, when you were working on the 5D Mark III and stuff, were you trying to get a flat picture out of the 5D or were you doing most of the stuff in camera picture profiles? Yeah, good question. So it's, it's, we've gone from one extreme to the other extreme. So everything in Canon, 
in camera, like that's what they teach in cinematography classes, is try and get everything right the first time so you don't have to try and fix it in post because that adds more time, it adds more money. So with the Canon camera, we have a, pit, uh, a picture style is what they call it with Canon cameras, um, where you basically set that and it shoots it exactly how you want it to look. So the actual picture style that we use in case people watching want to know, it's and there's four options and in this order it's zero, negative one, plus one, plus one. And that gives you the most saturation and also gives it the most cinematic look in my own opinion. Um, um, it doesn't give you a lot of room to um, adjust a lot of the colors in post, but it's perfect for when you're actually shooting. So that's the style that I use. Now that we shoot red, though, um, we are shooting in raw, as you pointed out. So we have to do a lot more workflow in post where we actually have to color correct it. Color correct it. Otherwise, it just looks too flat. So that's the reason why, from one extreme to the other, why we had to make that decision. So did you have to pick up a new, uh, learn a new program? Did you, are you working in Resolve for the RAW now and then moving on to Adobe or? Yeah, so those are all options. Because we do a video every week, every Monday, and a lot of times it takes two weeks to film our videos, mm -hmm. we don't have a week to sit around and go from one program to the other program. So we actually do everything exclusively in Adobe Premiere. We can open it up right there in Premiere. Look, it's called Source Settings. And we can see all the raw um, options there. So we, we color correct it all in Adobe Premiere, everything from start to finish. Cool. So um, I want to ask you just sort of uh, going back to the workflow, sort of on the production side. Um, you know, you're churning out videos at a pretty incredible rate considering, you know, how many different locations you're in around the world. So um, what does your travel schedule look like? How, how much of your time are you actually at home? And then how does post-production work? Are you like editing on a plane or do you have someone else who is doing editing for you or, or how does that work? Yeah, so we do it a couple different ways. There's there's four people on my team right now as far as filmmakers go. Um, and we all do every role. We all film, we all edit. Originally, it was just me and another guy named Parker. Um, we brought on two other people as well that are behind the scenes and also main videos. But the way it works is, well, we'll film all day. Let's just say our Assassin's Creed. We'll film for six days straight. We'll be editing it at night. We'll get home. We'll be exhausted. We just want to go to bed, but we'll start editing it in the hotel room. And we're like, okay, this looks good. This doesn't look so good. So tomorrow we're going to change this. So we're going to tweak this because we can't come back to Paris. Um, so we'll be editing that whole time. And we'll bring a lot of these um, Western Digital hard drives, the actual ones that we use, um, when we're on location. So we'll literally just put everything on these. Um, I'm editing right now on a MacBook Pro. On, it's fully upgraded, though, so it can handle the 4K footage. And we can edit in real time. So we're doing that in the hotel room. After that, we'll get on the airplane, fly back home. Um, and we'll be editing on the airplane. And then that's kind of how we do it, because then we'll get home. We'll have like three days where we have room to breathe. And then we'll go leave to Guatemala or... Canada. So we are always on the road. But once we get home, we'll back up what we have here on those big hard drives that I just showed you a second ago. So we know everything's backed up. We'll have it backed up two places. Um, and then we'll have our other teams that, that stayed back. They'll start working on what we haven't finished, such as the behind the scenes and fine tuning the main video. So that's kind of essentially our workflow as far as that, that process goes. But it does take time. We're here realistically, I'd say five days out of the month. Um, as far as home, home, and the rest of the time we are traveling, so we do have to do things on the road. Um, so your your a lot of your videos, being some of them that have the action sports element to it, um, you know, I watch them and I'm cringing like that looks dangerous. And then of course I watch your behind the scenes, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was dangerous. Is it is it you put the camera to your you know you put your eye up to the lens and you just don't feel the danger until you're done shooting or or are you feeling it while you're shooting and you just overcome it because you know it's going to be good? Yeah, so I'm terrified of heights, like terrified of heights. Like I will never do anything scary. Um, essentially, is how I view everything. So when I'm filming a rope swing and I'm hanging over a 700 foot building with a zip line, and they're base jumping off of it. It's terrifying, but once I look through that viewfinder, like you just pointed out, that fear goes away. Um, it's really weird how it works out, and that's kind of how I get my adrenaline rush is by filming things that are scary to me. With that being said, though, we're not going out there, and I'm not picking kids off the street saying, hey, I want you to jump off this building. Like We're making sure we take every safety precaution possible. So like the base jumping video we did in Panama was the world's longest zip line to base jump. I made sure I got the world's best athletes in that field to actually perform the stunts that we're doing. And then we spend two days rigging it to make sure it's safe, and we'll have them go ahead ahead of us, and then we'll get there once everything's ready. But we make sure everything is safety, and I mean, knock on wood, but we, we do have a perfect 
safety record as far as all that stuff goes. We do have people get hurt occasionally, yes, but as far as life and death, we haven't had to deal with any of that. But that's because we take so many safety precautions. Now, now what about your cameras? I, I, I'm, you had to have lost a couple of those. No, I, when I first, before I even started YouTube, I lost two Canon cameras, a 5D, and the next day, my 7D. So it was oh. very <laughs> heartbreaking to me. And it was because I was actually in Hawaii where my career started within YouTube, and I borrowed someone's underwater housing. It was a really cheap underwater housing. So that's what I suggest. Don't buy anything really cheap with camera equipment, especially if you're putting it underwater. And that's the mistake I made. Um, but that's the only time we've actually had cameras destroyed, and that was before like YouTube even started for me. Um, but we haven't had any cameras or anything we are we've, we've had a cam a couple cameras the only actually I take that back uh, we did a, a video it was a gigantic slip and slide through the streets of San Francisco and our phantom camera and our red camera both got splashed on because we, we are trying to get the camera as close to the action as possible because it makes people feel a part of it we got it a little too close so we had to send in both those cameras to get fixed um, so, I mean, that, that did cost a couple thousand dollars, which wasn't ideal, but we got the cameras back and they're working just fine. Um, cool. That would not have worked if it was salt water, though. So just a word of caution, don't get cameras around salt water because it's a different story. All right. So I've got uh, one more question for you, and then I think we've got like a rapid fire list of questions we'd like to give you. Um, okay. So, you know, you went to sort of a classic film school, but uh, you kind of participate in this new media, right? Um, is there any chance we'll ever see sort of a classic narrative film or documentary from you uh, through, you know, sort of classic distribution channels? Yeah, so my, my main goal, like, growing up is to tell, a, like, a Jurassic Park film or Indiana Jones. Like, those are the stories that I grew up watching or Star Wars that inspired me as a filmmaker. So if you actually look on my channel, I think the third video I did is called The Rabbit's Foot. Just look up on YouTube, The Rabbit's Foot. It's a very cinematic style, completely different than anything else on my channel. Those are the stories that I want to tell. What I noticed, though, is I put them on YouTube and they don't get the views, which means you can't basically make it into a business model. So I had to kind of go a different avenue. I'm still doing things I'm passionate about, but it's not like the main goal. So my main goal now is to build the biggest audience possible so I know I have support, and then I actually can go to a studio and say I have this many people that want to watch what we do, and then I can do those bigger stories. So that's kind of my, my long-form goal um, is doing that. So, yes, you will see that for sure. Awesome. Nice. We'll keep an eye out on uh, variety, I guess. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for joining us. We have a rapid fire, a one minute ish quiz that we give to everybody. It's called the Video Make Or Quiz. So, um, just basically, first response, whatever comes to your gut, uh, and and we'll just make our way through it, and then we'll set you on your way. We should say uh, we'll, we'll ditch the one minute timer this time since we've never made the one minute. So if you need yeah. to, uh, if you need to stop the clock and explain yourself. Yeah, one minute's more of a sort of unrealistic expectation than it is anything else, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, you ready? Yep, bring it on. All right. Mac or PC? Mac. iOS or Android? iOS. Adobe, Apple, or Avid? Adobe. Transformers or Schindler's List? Transformers. Digital or film? Digital. Uh, Pretty Woman or Dirty Dancing? I haven't seen either of them. <laughs> Coffee or tea? None, I don't drink either. Water? Uh, uh, Canon or Nikon? Canon. Red pill or the blue pill? Blue pill, because it's my favorite color. Hopefully it's a good one. <laughs> I don't remember which one is which in that. I don't either. It doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, golden hour or happy hour? Golden hour. Marvel or DC? Marvel, but it's hard because I love Batman. But... Yeah, everybody loves Batman, right? Yeah. Uh, Bat I'll say Marvel, though. I don't think we've had anyone say DC yet, which is kind of sad. Yeah. But, uh, well, I'll say DC. I just said DC then, in that case. Okay. Oh, all right, <laughs> cool. Switching his answer. Ma Maverick, all right. Um, Connery or Craig? Pierce Brosnan, to be honest. So wow. No. All right. Also, Fair the enough. only person to ever say Pierce Brosnan. All right. <laughs> I know that's, but I grew up playing GoldenEye for N64. Ah, uh, yes. That, that made me fall in love with the James Bond franchise. So then I bought every movie, and I've been the biggest James Bond fan because of Pierce Brosnan with GoldenEye. So you know that's what? The why. I can get behind that. I, I, I put in a few amount of hours in that game. Yeah. So. Uh, all right. We probably ought to know the answer to this, but Red or Alexa? Red. Uh, Dolly or Jib? Jib. Uh, Cher or Madonna? Can I say Cam? That's <laughs> what I'd use. You can say whatever you want, man. We're not going to hey, stop you. I can't. I disagree. <laughs> Cher or Madonna? Madonna. Uh, Prime or Zoom? Prime. Scripted or improv? Improv. Uh, big budget or no budget? No budget. 
All right. Uh, also, the first person to say no budget, I think. Uh, well, yeah, I think <laughs> Freddie Wong said big budget, but I mean $1,000. Well, that's the thing what people don't realize is the bigger the budget, the more in control they are, and the more you don't have your voice. And, and low budget, you have control because you can't have or someone else saying you have to do it this way. And the other thing is there's no pressure, and it forces you to be more creative. So it's a funner process for me. Now, I don't want to do zero-dollar budgets because you can't sustain yourself, but it, it is funner, and it's more of a challenge. Cool. Probably one of the few people, I guess, uh, who can say that uh, and uh, still do some pretty high-profile, yeah. uh, high-production-value work. Absolutely. So. Um, okay, so I think uh, that's pretty much it, eh, Greg? Yeah, thanks All right. for joining us. So uh, yeah, thanks, guys, Devin, for joining us. So um, I guess uh, for any of our viewers who don't know uh, who Devin Superchamp is, which uh, is probably unlikely, but just yeah. in case, uh, you can find Devin on YouTube, primarily uh, youtube.com slash Devin Supertramp. I think you're Devin Supertramp everywhere, right? On Twitter and Instagram. Yep. And, uh, so. yeah, Devin Supertramp YouTube on Facebook, I guess. And check out all the behind-the-scenes stuff, especially for our viewers. There's some good behind-the-scenes yeah. there where you can actually see how he's making some of these videos. And I, I found that, of course, really interesting because, you know, that's kind of what we do, so. And that's on our YouTube channel at Devin Graham. So if you just type in Devin Graham, that's our second channel. But, but that's, like you said, all our behind-the-scenes videos right there. Awesome. Cool. And again, uh, thanks to GlideCam for helping set up this interview. Definitely. Um, and uh, that's it for us. So thanks, Devin. All right. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right, have Over a good one. Now. All right, so that was Devin Graham, a.k.a. Devin Supertramp. Uh, super nice guy, super forthcoming. I mean, I, I could have talked to that guy, that guy for another half an hour, I think. Yeah, really, really interesting story. Um, and I think, uh, you know, video maker viewers and readers all over the place can learn a lot from, from him. Yeah. All right, so that's it uh, from us this week. So we'll see you next time. <laughs>